It's important that we pray, and I've been reading a lot lately about the, one of the missing ingredients of the American church as a whole is our, our lack of, of prayer. And, uh, and that spoke to me, so I've just been challenging my own life to, uh, to think more about that and as a church to lead ourselves in, in prayer more on it. So does anybody have any prayer requests, anything that... Uh, is a hot topic, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you got a sore toe, but, uh... How about Meredith still? Meredith Briggs, that's right. She's still, as far as I know, she's still in rehab? Yes. My wife went to the doctor and was told to stay home. Oh. And they, she was out weed whacking with one crutch, you know. <laughs> and then goes and wonders where her toes are swollen out, and the doctor said, you go home and you behave yourself, and you're going to have problems with swollen the rest of your life, so... I thought that was a swell idea. Yeah. <laughs> sure you do. <laughs> and so now she's taking the total now. Anyway. Mike is going back Friday. Friday, okay? Yeah. This might be it. He's pretty much better right now. It's real hard for him to breathe. And okay. He's, uh, he did something to his ribs, uh, coughing so much. So. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mike's did that. Merit. Anybody else? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy on the United States, really. We live here and we got a Bible. We walk into church with one or we have it on a phone. And, uh, we can talk to people at Hampton Beach on a Wednesday night and not have to worry about the policemen come taking us off. In some countries we get executed for that. So we're grateful. But we're grateful, Lord, you are God that is in control of every single government. We're going to learn about that today. And the things that go good and the things that go bad. And it's all according to plan. And you can be trusted. And I'm grateful for Meredith. What a blessing it is to visit that lady. She has a sense of humor even though she can't talk very fast right now. She's just a joy to be around. And I'm grateful for her. I'm grateful for Mike's dad. That you'll give him grace towards the end of the trail here for him. It's hard when you're limited and hurting and all of that. And I just pray for my wife. She can just have patience and heal up properly and do what the doctors tell her to do. Any of the rest of our number that are sick or hurting or can be, doesn't have to be physical, it can be emotional. Some of us are really hurting from loss and all kinds of things going on every day. And we live in a wicked world, that's for sure. Uh, but you save us out of it. And that's an amazing thought. And give us the hope for all eternity. Uh, the hope that is for seeing Jesus and being without sin forever. And uh, the conqueror of death. And we're grateful for him. And just commit the rest of our service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that my granddaughter gave me back my gift. <laughs> what do you get when you cross a four-leaf clover with poison ivy? A rash of good luck. <laughs> Anybody knows that? Yeah. What do Alexander the Great and Winnie the Pooh have in common? The middle name. <laughs> oh, I'll get it. No. <laughs> and this one I like because I come out of the seventies. <laughs> what do you call a hippie's wife? Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't resist it. <laughs> Alright, turn to Romans 13 if you would. No, actually not yet. Not yet. I kept uh, reading uh, Nancy's email about music and that she had uh, been thinking about um, an old hymn that meant a lot to her. We sang it, the first thing we sang, To God be the glory, great things he has done. It's an old hymn, but it means a lot to us. And I was just uh, reading this week about uh, Billy Graham and about some of the things he, some of the songs that he used in his crusades. And I thought you'd get a kick out of this. We've been told that we don't have to be better before placing our hope in the Almighty. That you simply have to come. Torn between the acceptance of God and man. Your life depends on one decision, and that is trust. 
Do you really believe God is who He says He is? And that's why in 1835, a lady by the name of Charlotte Elliott, 1835, uh, she faced a timeless question, and after suffering from a serious illness that caused her to be disabled, she felt purposeless and depressed while watching others constantly serve the kingdom of God. And to combat those feelings, the British woman began to write out the reasons she trusted the Lord. That list was the start of the hymn, Just As I Am, which would later become one of the most popular hymns of all time and the classic ending for all the calls at Billy Graham's Crusades. I want to just to put this all together. 99 years after Mrs. Elliot wrote Just As I Am, a teenage farm boy heard the hymn while attending a revival. He then stepped forward and surrendered to God while another hymn, almost persuaded now to believe, was, was sung. Who do you suppose that was? Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Isn't that something? That man was Billy Graham who would eventually select Just As I Am to play during his gospel invitations. Chosen for its lyrics and response, O Lamb of God, I come. And strong biblical basis, Graham believed the crusade hymn reflected the choice to follow God. In his autobiography, he would later would later be named Just As I Am. That's how he titled his autobiography, Just As I Am. Similarly, an 18-year-old George Beverly Shea. You ever heard of him? He's the one saying it in all the crusades. Came forward to accept Christ after repeatedly singing Just As I Am during a special week of evangelistic meetings. He said this, I could hardly wait to stand with the congregation and sing just as I am, he said. I could sing and comfort my heart which was so convicted, rather than make that public confession. I was satisfied just to sing and not go forward. However, that Friday night, Shane did go forward, placing his hope in Christ alone. Isn't that something? George Beverly Shea won a talent contest in New York City. You know who else was in that talent contest? Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra took second place. George Beverly Shea took first place. And Shea was offered a contract with uh, Radio City Music Hall, I think it was. I'm not exactly sure about that part of it. What, and, and Shea said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go. Billy Graham had asked him to go with him and sing at his crusades. And, and you know what Frank Sinatra is famous for? I did it my way. Yeah. Isn't that something? George Beverly Shea did it the Jesus way. I just, isn't that great? Yeah. When you think about some of this stuff. And, and uh, more than emotion, in the 60s, as thousands were responding to the gospel of Billy Graham crusades, the media and critics of his methods uh, uh, the, the media reported that it was due to just as I am playing on the crowd's emotions. Do you get it? Yeah. Just as I am, without, and he kept singing it and playing. I mean, you, you, and let's face it, I, I know as a preacher, you can whip up a crowd. You can, and they do it all the time, and they manipulate and all kinds of things and get them working on emotions. But let, just let's get this out. Uh, uh, the media reported it was due to just as I am playing on the crowd's emotions during the altar call. While certainly the forthcoming lyrics and gentle melody are comforting to one's mind, Billy Graham wanted to prove it was the Holy Spirit doing the work and not that song. After praying through the situation and consulting with his music leader, Cliff Barrows, they decided to skip the hymn during the 66th Crusade in London. For 30 nights, not a single note of the signature of Crusade hymn was sung or played, but people still silently came forward. I just think that's cool. When the reporters began to write about the invitation at Earl's Court, they said that all they heard was the shuffling of feet on the floor. And Barrows recalled, bring back just as I am, the silence is killing us, they wrote. <laughs> and I don't know what that all means, but I just thought that was a very interesting thing. Music is a big part of worship and a big part of evangelism. And uh, for you, those of you who uh, haven't been over to uh, 
Hampton Beach on a Wednesday night. We hope to go again this Wednesday. And I, I guess the reason that's on my mind is I see what's going on at Hampton Beach and I see what maybe we all ought to be doing more than we're doing. And that is just sharing the simple message of Christianity with unsaved people. And uh, a guy named Chris, is that his name? Chris, what a fantastic young man doing a bang up job of just keeping it simple. And then we just had fantastic conversations. And uh, we're gonna, Lord willing, if the weather's good, we'll be there again this Wednesday. Just uh, whoever shows up. Okay. Now let's go to Romans 13. See, that was all just introduction. That had nothing to do. I promise the rolls won't burn. It'll have you out of here. Romans 13, chapter 13. Just the first seven verses. Again, I said we'd slow down because these things are, this is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to real Christianity. Our relationship to each other, our relationship in, in relation to gifts, and uh, the Christian graces of how to live and love each other properly and all that. And now comes our relationship to civil government here. Really, and this does a challenge, man. Verse 1 of chapter 13 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been, what? Instituted or ordained by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. <clears throat> and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. And he wrote that when <coughs> Nero was on the throne. <laughs> he think about that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Open our hearts to this and may this just be practical. We've got to really do a lot of thinking. We're in a <coughs> political time in our country where there's, we're polarized on a lot of issues. And Christians have to figure out, okay, what am I supposed to fight for? What am I supposed to let go? Uh, how am I supposed to behave myself? Am I supposed to do what they tell me? And all of that is a real practical, real life issue. So help us to figure this out from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, Amanda, where do you live? Do you feel this is the town you live in? What's the state you live in? And answer, what's the country you live in? Where are you a citizen of? United States. United States. Okay. How about that? Mm -hmm. 
citizens of heaven. Absolutely. That's right. We are citizens of heaven. Uh, Roger Caswell's a British evangelist, and years ago I had him come. I heard him preach at Word of Life, and I thought, man, I'd love to have that guy. He tried to do, what, two weeks of revival meetings all around southern New Hampshire. It didn't go very good. It wasn't like Billy Good. <laughs> but he was a really good, probably still living, a good evangelist. And uh, he said, Jeff, uh, we're citizens of heaven. We're not citizens of this earth. We've got to really figure out what's my responsibility to the United States versus what's my responsibility to the kingdom of heaven. And that's a challenge that we've all got to work on. And I want you to, if you just took, if you just took Romans 13, you might think, okay, if the government tells me not to preach anymore, if you just took this, you'd almost think, well, I guess then that means they told me I can't preach it. Right? And you do the... Uh, but let's, I want you to go to uh, Genesis 9, 6 to start with. We're going to walk this through. What's the scripture tell us? All the scripture, when you put it all together, what's the scripture tell us about civil authority? Genesis, first book of the Bible. Uh, actually, Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. First time that's said is in Genesis 9. Why are you in Genesis 9? Flip over to Genesis 4. Don't you love it? Chapter 4. Right? Chapter 4. Up until Genesis 9, 6, God was taking care of things when it came to civil government. The punishment of evil, God was handling it. When, uh, when they ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when they ate the fruit of the tree, he, uh, he banished them from the garden. Uh, he covered them with coats of skins. He took care of the problem. When Cain slew Abel, which is what we're at here now in ch chapter 4, verse 10. Well, let's start at verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from the land. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, No, no, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The, the whole the concept of an ancient civilization, go to what? Uh, Go to verse, see, verse, verse 23. Still in four? Still in four. <coughs> Cain had children, uh, population grew, until Lamech shows up. And Lamech said to his wife, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Verse 23. You wise of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man from my wounding. A young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. The idea is all the way through this, God's handling it. He's taking care of the transgressions. But when you get over to chapter 9, by the time you get to chapter 9, God has punished the earth with a flood. And they're going to start a new civilization, chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, 
and upon every bird of the heavens, and upon everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. For every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. What happened? A new start. Hmm? A new start. A new start? But what did they eat up until this time? They were vegetarians up until this time. I think that's why we have the teeth we have. Personally, possibly. That could be a heresy. But. <laughs> All right? But now, animals are dying. We can actually eat meat. For, the, for those of you vegetarians that decide to be vegetarians, um, don't keep steak away from me. No. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, every moving thing, verse 3, that lives shall be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood I will require reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from every man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. And here it is. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Theologians have called this the establishment of civil government, where actually someone now is going to wear a badge, and if you kill someone, someone's going to take you and administer justice. It got put from God's hands into man's hands. Does that... You see it? Anybody have any question? Not that I could answer it. Okay? It's kind of cool how this all works out now. And, and you now, verse 7. And you be fruitful and multiply and increase greatly on the earth and multiply it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. That's called the Noahic Covenant, where God made his covenant with Noah, and he established civil government, and put the stuff into the hands of man. So, go to Romans 13 again now. <laughs> the concept of citizens of heaven. I read, uh, this is something I read, I just, I could say I stole it, it was written way back years ago, uh, and I found it in one of my commentaries. One of the crucial issues before the church in America today is, and this was written uh, 40 years ago, shall we be American with a pinch of religious flavoring, <coughs> or shall we be Christ people with a pinch of American flavoring? Did you catch that? And am, am I going to be a Christian in America, or am I, or am I going to be an American? Uh, I, I just think that's really a valid question. I think the issue is crucial because there are many in our churches today, many of us, who have not seriously and earnestly asked themselves, am I more American than I am Christian? Are there not impulses in our society which define us in the world as Americans? and which influence us, influence us daily, but which are incompatible with the Christ life and the cross life. You catch that? Say that again. I will. <laughs> <laughs> am I more American than I am Christian? Are there not impulses in our society which define us in the world as Americans and which influence us daily? but which are incompatible or not compatible with the Christ life and the cross life. Another way of putting it, maybe in my own words, is is democracy Christianity? A lot of us will fight for democracy, almost thinking that democracy is Christianity. Now, believe me, socialism is not Christianity. 
Either, you know what I'm saying? But we've got to ask ourselves, okay, what's... Am I, a, am I really a citizen of heaven, or am I a citizen of the United States? And do I, so the government... I'm, I'm going to get myself in trouble probably right now. But there's a lot of redneck Americans now that are rednecks calling themselves Christian that probably aren't Christian, but I don't know that they're spirit-led in the way they're acting when it comes to their political process. Have I got myself in trouble yet? No. <laughs> 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 Something to think about. Uh, because, and, and I've, well, I've always said that if, if we were as concerned about the gospel message as we were about the country, we'd be sharing the faith a lot more. We really would be. Um, so, okay, let me see now. I will, I would not constantly being shaped by forces in our culture which make it almost impossible for the world to see any difference in our values. If we're never going to appear to the world as aliens and exiles on the earth, then we're going to have to go back and renew the declaration of allegiance by which we became Christians, namely, that Jesus is Lord. And we're going to have to wake up to the fact that this is a cultural and political statement. Many of us, myself included, in the past more so than now, I'm starting to rethink some things. I used to be strongly American and strongly in view of democracy and strongly in favor of uh, conservative political views. And in a conversation with an unsaved person, I might win the battle but I've lost the war. You follow what I'm saying? It's like, that, that isn't the big issue. That's this bigger fish to fry. You follow what I'm saying? The biggest fish is what we're going to deal with here in a minute. The biggest fish to fry, as a Christian. And I just think... All right. Go to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus. Genesis, Exodus, the second book, chapter 1. We're going to just take a kind of a bird's eye view of a few things when it comes to civil authority and our submission to authority. At verse 15, Exodus 1, 15. When I hear the pages flap, that's music in God's ears. And cool. Amen. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua. <laughs> I like those names, that's cool. If I had daughters, I'd name them Shipra. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. Who's telling these midwives what to do here? The king of Egypt. Right? The civil authority, the king of Egypt. When you serve as a midwife, if you see it's a son, kill him. Verse 17, But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them but let the male children live. So, the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So, God dealt well with the midwives. Two issues here. One we're not really dealing with today, but what would they just do? Yeah. Is there such a thing as a white lie? It's a, remember when, uh, who's it, uh, Rahab hid, hid the spies in the roof? And they said, where are the spies? She said, I don't know where they are. They were up in the attic, right under the sheaves of grain or whatever it was. She, she lied. And yet God blessed. Uh, that's another topic. Uh, well, it might even be a lie, but the, the greater good was she knew about the judgment. Uh, the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women, Okay, God, God dealt well with the midwives, verse 20. 
And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Go now to uh, Daniel. Right at the end of the major prophecy. Jeremiah and Ezekiel and then Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. Another instance. Daniel 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and his breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And the king sent to gather the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the counselors and the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps and all those other guys, let's go down a couple of sentences, they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the end of verse 3, and verse 4 now, and the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, and all those other instruments, you're supposed to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. If you've read Daniel, you're familiar with this, right? Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of, the, of those instruments, they fell down and worshipped. Go to verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. My shack, your shack, and a condo. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? I like that. I heard that years ago. My shack, your shack, and a condo. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you set up. So Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that the three of those guys be brought. They brought these men before the king. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? And what happens to them? Uh, now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, fall down and worship the image I've made, and well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God, small g, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. I like this. Talk about bold. If this is so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, I'm going to tell you one thing right now, King. We will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. So whether he saves us or not, we're not doing it. Now, did Paul know the book of Daniel? He, as a Hebrew, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews that touched the law of Pharisee, right? He knew the Old Testament really well. Go to Daniel chapter 6. Another situation. And James said, Please, Darius, who was the king of the Medes and Persians after Babylon had fallen in Daniel's lifetime, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps would give an account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. And no error or fault was found in him. So, these men said... We're not going to find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in a connection, in connection with the law of his God. 
Wouldn't it be nice if someone in your association said, you know, this, I mean, we're not going to be able to find anything that we can dig up on Jeff unless we do it against the law of his God? Would anybody give like a run for president? You see what they do to people? The, in the, the, the reporters and all the dirt they try to find on people? Right? And, and this, the, Daniel was blameless. It was amazing. What a testimony he had. So, these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, all these guys, we agree. He should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed. Why did they do that? Because they knew Daniel wouldn't obey it. We're going to get rid of this guy, right? So that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. So he signs the document. In verse 10, I like this. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house, where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem, and got down on his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God, and notice the last half of this sentence. As he had done previously. He had a prayer habit. And nothing was going to change his prayer habit. Okay? Darius to me puts out the commandment. You can't pray to any other God. Daniel knows God's higher than you, Darius. I'm still praying. Go to the New Testament now, Acts chapter 4. Seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, 
They had nothing to say in opposition, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what are we going to do with these guys? A notable sign has been performed throughout by them, and that's evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them, now remember this is the leaders, the priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. Verse 18, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And I love this. Peter and John said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you judge, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them, because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Go to chapter 5, verse 27. They're back in the temple again. And just, just to get the concept of all this, they're back in the temple again, chapter 5, verse 27. They got, they're up to their same tricks. They're still preaching. And uh, in fact, the context, uh, go to verse 24. When the temple, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching people. And the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must do what? Obey, Obey God rather than men. Obey God rather than men. Alright, so now let's go back to Romans 13. Ambassadors for Alright, cool. Ambassador for Christ. Um, I apologize, I'd like to have you go to Second Corinthians five instead of Romans thirteen. Verse 16. And now just, just think through what I've gone through when it comes to uh, what happened there in uh, Exodus with the midwives. Daniel's situation. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then uh, the New Testament. Those leaders trying to get them to shut their mouth and not preach the gospel. That's beginning to happen in our country. They're starting to have us, they've taken the law out of school, the Ten Commandments out of the school, and they really don't like it when you preach on the street. They really don't like it. But so far we still have the ability to do that. Um, so go to verse 16. From now on, therefore, 
We regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? Creation. Creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, is King James. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Anybody watch football game last night? Yeah. Don't be ashamed. John did. Somebody did. John. All right. Who's who's the uh, who's the Patriots quarterback that's quite famous now? Tom Brady. Tom Brady. That was good. I don't even like it. <laughs> Good call, Val. Good call. Anyway, I wore a uh, Boston Red Sox shirt yesterday to the dump. Didn't even know. I just put on a shirt, right? and my son gave me a Boston Red Sox shirt. I was putting my stuff in, it, and the guy came over and said, "You're still wearing that shirt?" And I said, "Oh, what? Why?" He says, "They're 18 games behind." <laughs> I guess they're in the cellar or something. But anyway, that's that's baseball, right? So that's baseball. What's a baseball? Baseball's round, isn't it? Yeah. Right? What's a football? A football is kind of whatever you want to call it, right? We can put a fish on the end there, that means Christians. So see, that means Christians can watch football. I got that from God this morning, but no. No. Years ago, there was a guy named Vince Lombardi. Lombardi. Okay, you guys know your football. Okay, Vince Lombardi was a professional football coach, dealing with people like Tom Brady and Julian Edelman and uh, Gronkowski and all these guys that have been playing football from the time they were little kids up through leagues. Then through junior high, high school, college, a lot of them, and get taken and brought into the professional football league, correct? You know what Lombardi would do at the beginning of every practice? No. He held up a football and said, gentlemen, this is a football. In front of professional football players. What's the point? What do you think he was doing? Showing the symbolism of what they were doing. If someone never played football, if you were just teaching someone the basics or the essentials of the game of football, where would you start? You start with number one, well, first of all, this is a football, okay? He's getting that, okay? What's the football of Christianity? Okay? There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Right? We've been given a love letter. And it talks about something that we, we hear about week after week after week after week. All the other stuff. That message is not an American message, is it? And regardless of what government is in power, if you are in China right now, I understand you have to go underground to be a Christian. And I think we just have got it so good in America, we don't even think about it anymore. But we are ambassadors, uh, right there. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Now go back to Romans 13.
Let every person be subject to the higher powers or governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Even bad governments are ordained by God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, who resist, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rules are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. What do you think Paul's talking about in the context of this passage? You ever think about what is this talking about? An authority that says you can't preach, given everything we know. Paul was one of the ones that was told not to preach in the book of Acts. And he said, I think I ought to obey God rather than man. So we know he's not talking about that, right? When civil government says you're not supposed to throw away plastic, you're supposed to recycle it. You're not supposed to throw away aluminum, you're supposed to recycle it. When the speed limit all the way up Route 107 is 35 miles an hour. Oh, you're really touching my toes. <laughs> Civil government. It says here, if you, uh, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. For rules are not of terror to good conduct but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. How many of you have a wallet in their pocket? Okay? I won't, I won't have to do this, but you can... If you want to look at my wallet, I've got no phone numbers in there that I'm ashamed of. Forty-five years ago I did. Forty-five years ago if I dropped my wallet somewhere and someone picked it up, I might have said, boy, I hope they didn't look inside. Because I had stuff, but I, I have a clear conscience now about that stuff. Yeah. You walk into my house, and I had a deacon in Rome, New York, who used to, as a joke, he thought it was a joke, but it bothered some people. He'd go into their car, and he'd turn on the radio in their car and see what they were listening to. See if they were listening to worldly music, you know what I mean? And he thought it was a joke, but, okay, turn on my radio, go into my house, check the magazine rack. Go up in the attic, check under the ceiling tiles. I've got nothing hidden. I've got nothing, right? I've got all my computers and all my technology has protection on it. I can't go there. I will say this, though. This happened yesterday. That I wasn't. In, it's not my notes. I went on Facebook to see my my children down, my grandchildren down in Tennessee, and this girl's picture pops up, and I thought it was one of my classmates with a, a new last name. So I clicked on that to see who it was to see if I it wanted to be my friend. Uh, it was a friend request, right? I'm not very high on technology. And you know what the next thing was? Click this if you want to see naked pictures of me. That's what we got in our face nowadays, guys. And I'm, I've got snow on the roof. <laughs> but there's still fire in the furnace, right? I mean, it's, it's just... <laughs> Why are you laughing, Bruce? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No snow on your roof. There's no. no. <laughs> the authorities are set up by God, but the whole point is, if if you got nothing to hide, you got nothing to worry about. Isn't that true? As our government gets more and more invasive, and as population grows more and more, there's going to be things that are going to come in. In order to manage more and more people, you have to have more and more rules. I don't like it, no one likes it, but that's part of, I think, understanding what happens. And it's all, we can get all fired up over those secondary issues when the football is being neglected. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. I do believe Scripture teaches capital punishment. I don't know what else you'd use a sword for. He does not bear the sword in vain. Paul was saying back at the time this was written, 
the authority, the civil authority, I think Genesis 9-6 is still in effect. And if you don't have serious consequences for people doing something wrong, then they just encourage that once more to continue to keep doing it. It's tough. It's tough. And, uh, okay, for he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. And because of this, you also pay taxes. Remember when they tried to catch Jesus, and they had a coin, and he said, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And he said, whose image is on the coin? He said, Caesar's, then render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and unto God that which is God's. We've got to pay taxes. We've got to submit to civil authority. But we don't submit to them when they ask us to sin. Um, I'm going to be done here in just one second. Paul simply does not have in view in this passage the problem of evil governments. Instead, he has in view a good government in doing good deeds, a good government in which doing good deeds will generally find approval, and doing evil will generally be punished. If this is correct, then it will no longer be possible to insist that Christians should always be subject to governing authorities. As long as authorities punish only what is evil and praise only what is good, submission to God will always conform to submission to the authorities. But if the authorities ever begin to punish the good and reward the bad, as has repeatedly happened in church history, then submission to God will bring us into conflict with the authorities. So the command to be subject in verses 1 and 5 is not absolute. It depends on whether subjection will involve us in doing wrong. The ultimate criteria of right and wrong is not whether a ruling authority commands it, but whether God commands it. The fact that God has ordained all authority does not mean all authority should be obeyed. It is right to resist what God has appointed in order to obey what God has commanded. Catch that? Say it again. It is right to resist what God has appointed, which would be He has ordained maybe an, an evil government, in order to obey what God has commanded. God is sovereign in the people he puts in power over us, but they're not all good. Uh, he goes on to talk about Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Pilate, Domitian, Bloody Mary, Adolf Hitler, Idi Amin, all kinds of people, evil people. And the question, the final question is this, will we save our lives and submit to the ruling authority, or will we say with Peter we must obey God rather than man, and thus risk our lives? a tall order, isn't it? Roman, uh, Romans talks about civil authority. Guys, I just challenge you. Be more Christian than you are American. And I am as patriotic as anybody is. I've had a son spend a lot of his life in war. And he's still paying the price. But I still know there are times when our government's wrong. And we have to do what God tells us to do. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of scripture and uh, real issues. Sometimes difficult issues. But it's something we need to think about as Christians. Decide where we're going to draw our line. And also, uh, we're ambassadors in a foreign country. We are not citizens, ultimately, of America. We're citizens of heaven. So God, help us to live as ambassadors. We obey the laws of the country we're in. But for a higher reason, a higher calling, help us to let our light shine among men and try to lead them to Christ, to what really matters. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.